Well, hi guys. Welcome to the first ever Solo Travel Woman series, Tips for Traveling Solo. I am so excited for this series and what it's going to turn into. I am so excited to have you all on here, whether live. If you are live, drop a one below. If you're re-watching this later, drop a two below because I just want to see when you're able to catch it because if we have to change times in the future to accommodate more people, this is good feedback for us. So I am so excited. We have a, a great first episode, I'm calling it, on <laughs> today. Yes for you. Um, first, I want to just tell you a little bit about the solo travel woman movement and how this got started. So I have always had a passion for travel, but it wasn't something I did. Um, growing up, we did a lot of domestic trips to visit family who were out of town, but I never really went on any international trips except to Canada. I'm from Buffalo, New York, so Canada is very accessible for, for us to go Super to. Close. Yeah, and back in the day, you didn't need a passport. You just went up there. It was so mm -hmm. easy. So traveling internationally wasn't really something for me. And then college happened and life happened and jobs happened. I didn't find myself actually start traveling until I started working in corporate events and actually having to go to different destinations. And my father always kept saying, Sarah, don't put this off. You have to travel. You have to get out there. One of his most favorite things about being in the Marine Corps was the ability to travel. Yes, upstate New York. <laughs> um, and so I decided to listen to him. And I, for my 30th birthday, was sick of waiting for this person's schedule to, you know, accommodate the trip or this or that. Yeah, exactly. And I always said, if I can go anywhere before I die, it has to be Greece. And so for my 30th birthday, I booked my first solo trip to Greece and Turkey. I was there for about two and a half weeks and it was the absolute best time. So over the course of the years, I really just got a passion for solo travel. I trekked Machu Picchu. I went to Peru by myself. I've gone to the UK. I've gone to places in the Caribbean and it's just become a real passion of mine. Now I like to travel with other people, but when I really want to dive into the culture, which we'll get into when we start talking about Jess's business mm -hmm. and her I like going by myself because then I could do it at my own pace. And so the purpose of the solo travel movement is really to inspire and empower women and travelers, even if you're not a woman, it is totally cool. We want you here. We want you to take part in this, but really it's to empower people to travel the world, travel smarter and without anything holding you back. So that in a nutshell, guys, is how the solo travel movement got started and why we're here today. It has grown into a beautiful business. And I plan trips for people. I do the blog. I have something really cool coming out soon that I thought I'd share today, but I'm not quite ready yet. I will share soon. Um, but without further ado, I really want to introduce our guest today. She is part of the inspiration behind why I kicked this off because I really wanted her story out there and I wanted to really start something where we feature many women who have traveled the world by themselves and hear their stories. So Jess, without further ado, talk about who you are and talk about the wonder word all right girl i got you first of all i wanted to say thank you so much for having me um this is like this is really fun and i think that also it is important to have a little venue where we can talk about this this uh you know solo travel and also female specific but kind of invite everyone and inspire everyone i think that um it's been a buzzword and also, I just feel like, you know, you're creating this little community where we can share ideas, we can share stories, um, share tips. And I really like what you're doing. And um, I'm excited to be here, but also to see like the next ones, because I want to also hear other people's perspective and other people's advices and everything. Um, so I think it's super important what you're doing. And thank you for, for letting me be a part of that. So um, if you guys don't know me, my name is Jess, and I am a cultural immersion coach. Uh, for my company, The Wander Word. Um, and a lot like Sarah, The Wander Word is kind of like a culmination of a lot of experiences that I've had in my life. Um, oh my God, you guys, my life went out. All right, here I am. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it was kind of, um, I think I, I grew up in a similar type of dynamic in the sense that I um, grew up somewhere where it wasn't very diverse and I always kind of like craved that um, and was drawn to specifically other languages. Um, 
And I was always like really excited if I ever heard someone like in the store when I was little with my mom, like speaking another language. And I just always was super curious about this. Um, and so that kind of grew more when I went to high school. I studied Italian and French at the same time. It's just like how it ended up happening. Um, and I was really shy, <laughs> so shy in, uh, in high school and not a very social person at all. And for whatever reason, I decided that it was the best idea ever to take a six week exchange program uh, with my school to Paris. And it was the first time I ever like was away from my family. It was the first time I ever left the country. Um, and it was the first time that I ever like was with a group of my peers all the time. So it was really eye opening at such a young age. Um, and it was also very overwhelming too. Um, I'm sure you've had the sensation and some of you guys watching when you get off the plane somewhere new and you don't know about it and it's just kind of like a smack in the face in a good way, I mean, but it's also like really shocking. When um, I, and I really, yeah, it, yeah, you know what I mean? I had to take, I was like, what? I don't, I don't know what you're saying. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, you know, part of cultural immersion is also preparing for that, but I repeated the same experience um, in Italy and then um, fast forward to after high school, I was like hustling, working a lot of jobs and I started to teach, um, to do tutoring. And then that kind of like spiraled into teaching um, part time at a middle school. And then all of a sudden I was teaching full time at a high school. Um, I teach Italian. I've also taught French um, at the high school level and I've taught English and Spanish private tutoring um, when I started out. So it was just, you know, all, all these things happening. And I got involved in a lot of different projects um, at, at, you know, my schools. Um, and they were always centered around culture and promoting the diversity in my school because we have a lot. Um, and then I started taking kids on trips. So this is when it really um, came together, kind of combining the experience that I had in high school and also studying abroad in college and like actually having friends in Italy and visiting them, et cetera, and taking my students. Um, it, it, was, it was so eye-opening to me to be able to see that through someone else's eyes, their first time going abroad and their first time having that culture shock and their first time trying to figure out the puzzle piece of culture immersion. Um, and so that kind of just went forward from there. But the last kind of part of that is I took them on tours and they were very fast paced. Um, and it was, you know, in a group with a tour guide and the tour guides were great. And we stayed at hotels and the hotels were super cool. But it felt very rushed and it felt like we weren't really getting in that deep contact that I was able to have through exchange programs, through studying abroad. And I wanted to give my students the opportunity. I felt like I was kind of ripping them off in a way. Literally, the tours are very expensive. If you've ever taken a tour before, it's, you know, it's obviously going to be more expensive than if you were to piece it together by yourself. Um, People trying to go to the same place at once and you're rushed through and there's might be another and it's insane when you're with yeah it's like a factory you know it's like a machine cranking it out you know <laughs> next coliseum take your pictures okay all right let's go to the vatican take your pictures says uh, michelangelo you know the, everything like that and so and then and, and all these things are great you know <laughs> yeah all these things are great and and uh i'm not knocking them but you know it was a lot missing for me as far as the culture immersion piece and really getting in contact with the place that you are instead of just passing through kind of like bulldozing um yeah. and moving on so that spurred me to kind of create exchange programs and try to recreate that experience that i had in my own schooling for my students um and it was just like a, a game changer um i realized that I, I really enjoyed doing this to put the trip together for my students. Um, I took 10 of them and to reach out to the school and make that connection with the school and um, to find an apartment to stay for that time, you know, over there and all these things and matching the kids up with the family. And so the Wonder Word kind of came out of like the need to really be able to do things like that all of the time. Um, because I feel, you know, uh, as a public school teacher, we are really constrained by the four walls of our classroom. And it's not always exactly how you would want it to be the experience that you really want to give your students. Um, so the Wonder Word came out of all of this and really wanting to be a cultural immersion coach for people, teaching people how to access the culture before they go on the trip, while they're there, and how to process it when they get home so that they can make more experiences. Um, and it's, uh, you know, also about, uh, of course, I'm, I'm a language teacher, so that's, that's happening. Um, if that's, you know, something that people are interested in learning languages. Um, I could teach Italian, French, Spanish, and English. And then, um, you know, really making a point of 
of traveling like you live there. Yeah. Making memories, not buying souvenirs. Um, and, uh, you know, a culture immersion through soul travel and, uh, and self-love through wonder. Yeah. Giving love- yourself the space. Yeah, it's, it's important. It's very important for, for all of us, for me and for, and for everybody here. Um, because you can really explore a place and connect with it and explore yourself and connect with yourself um, if you allow the time and space to, to do those things. And it's also better for the community soul travel and cultural immersion and it's better for you so really it's kind of like the backstory i definitely want to talk more about the cultural immersion and what that looks like but i really want to know i kind of want to talk about solo travel for a minute and so you've gone you dived in you went there for six weeks um to paris um on that exchange trip but what really made you get into traveling solo? Because I know you have taken trips by yourself, not even with an exchange group. And, you know, was it something you do at first? And if so, what are some tips you can give our audience on how to overcome those nerves? Um, because I know that's something that really inhibits a lot of people from traveling solo. For sure. Yeah. So I'll tell you kind of how it started. Um, similar to to you i was kind of like sick of waiting for people to commit to taking trips um and i think this is a a problem for a lot of us um and so and we feel maybe even rude if we don't go with someone else so we feel kind of guilty like we're not including them but it's not true um so my first solo travel actually happened by accident um after (laughs) like uh, it really was it was after a really rough time in my life um some relationship hardships, financial hardships, and a lot of stuff, a lot of bullshit, you guys. You, you know what happens in life, a lot of stuff. Um, but I'm very That's grateful for, for where I'm at right now. I'm really grateful. Um, and so the opportunity arose after all of this, this struggle time for me to be able to take a trip. And so I invited my best friend and I was like, you know, I really, let's, let's, go, let's go on a trip. Let's go this summer. Let's go three weeks. Let's go soul travel. We'll go um, uh, to Amsterdam. Because uh, we both always wanted to go there. And then I'll take you to Italy, show you around and do the whole thing. She said, okay, yeah, let's go. And then we bought the tickets and everything. And a couple months later, when it, the trip was approaching, she backed out. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no, it's right. Oh, Last shit. Was... Was... Sure. Yeah. And so I was like, all right. I had the decision about what I was going to do. And I was like, you know what? fuck it, I'm gonna go, like, we're, like I'm gonna go by myself. You know, I did all this work, I, I, I planned the trip and everything, I'm gonna go. And I went and it was amazing. It completely changed my whole entire life. I can't even tell you, um, it was just so liberating. And, and just like you said, it really allowed me to kind of just take control of my own day and explore places in the way that I wanted to, which isn't necessarily always what someone else would want to do. Everyone's different. That's, that's the beauty of the world. Everyone's diverse. I want to highlight one thing you said there that I want all of you watching to hear again is it changes your life and it is liberal. You learn so much about yourself when you are traveling by yourself. You don't have someone to depend on, someone to lean on, someone to make decisions for you. Mm -hmm. You are left to your own instincts, left to your own gut. You are left to your own devices and interests and you get to do whatever you you want to sleep till 3 p.m. because you had a night that's fine like you don't have to worry about what you want and you just like I mean I've learned so much about myself from solo travel Mm -hmm. yeah I totally agree and and it's really interesting um I think you know and even before this trip I had lived alone but it's it's uh your comfort zone right yeah you're safe you're in your hometown or your home state or wherever you've been living and you have your friends and family you have, or at least you have your routines, right? And you have your places that you go and your supermarket. And so it's not the same, right? You get taken out of your comfort zone, you get placed somewhere else and you figure it out alone. And this is a very empowering thing. It's yeah. very empowering. And for me personally, it really did help me grow my self-love and my self-esteem. And it really upped my level of self-care as well because I, it was kind of like the first time I ever made myself a priority just because no one else was around, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah. And, and it, and I was nervous. Um, I was very nervous and, uh, you know, particularly when I was going to Amsterdam because I had never been there before and I don't speak Dutch. 
It's yeah. very hard, Dutch. You, if anyone um, who's listening, Dutch people, it's very difficult, your language, but I really like it. And you have some really good rap music, too, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's a party so, city. The thing you want to see is late at night, too, and that can make people nervous going out by yourself late at night. You know what? Yes. And, and um, this is true about Amsterdam, for sure. However, it's nice because it's in one area. So if you don't like that, you just, you don't need to go to that area. And there's a whole other big city of a bunch of other things to do. And a, and a lot of them don't have anything to do with partying. So it's, it's really great. Um, yes. I had yeah. the best time there. I, I did like uh, river, like boat dinners. <laughs> I stayed at like some rundown hostel outside of the city. Like, <laughs> but it was mm -hmm. the best experience ever. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> just Awesome. Don't eat the edibles late. That's my only yeah, careful. Going to Amsterdam. Don't do the edibles late at night. Yeah. You'll think they'll bite you. The next thing you know, you pull the hair off the rocker. So just it's delicious. Just be it's, safe. Yeah, it's delicious, and you're like, oh, this is a cookie. This is so good. And then like two hours later, you're like, all right, I'm going to bed. Um, yeah. I, so. Um, <laughs> well, I wanted. So clearly, your love for travel, different cultures really resulted in why you created the Wander Word and wanting to provide these experiences that you were lucky to experience to other people. So can you tell us a little bit more of what travelers can learn from immersive travel? Like how does that change their travel experience? And if someone was interested in starting and taking their own first like immersive travel journey, how do they get started? Is that something you could help them with or anything you wanna share about that? Yeah, I can for sure help you. Um, I mean, as a cultural immersion coach, it's kind of like I would teach you what that looks like and help you do that type of research at your destination, wherever that may be. Um, so, you know, obviously my expertise is um, Italy, France, a, a lot of countries in Europe. Um, and and so I, I can just go right off the, the cusp with those type of cultural immersion experiences and help you do the research. So cultural immersion, it really... Um, is, is a, a term that means that you are going to a destination so that you can interact with the culture and to not be a passive spectator. And, you know, like kind of like we were saying before, that fast, quick mass tours and kind of bulldozing through. That I think uh, a easy way to think about it is that's kind of the opposite of, of cultural immersion. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, to have a culturally immersive experience, you, you want to kind of remove the boundaries, okay, between yourself and the place that you're visiting. So mm -hmm. some examples of boundaries would be um, tour buses, tour groups, and these types of things, because you're taking away opportunities for yourself to interact with locals, um, yeah. just because you're with a group, you know what I mean? Um, so, and I witnessed this with my own students as well, when we went on the fast tour, they didn't, they never talked to any Italians. Why, why would they? They don't have to, yeah, they don't need to. And then when we did the exchange, you know, I mean, they're still best friends now. This one came to visit here. The, the other one went back to Italy to visit. And this is a lifelong thing. Even me, um, my, my sorella Italiana, Francesca, I stayed with her and we still talk, you know, to this day. And I saw her, um, I, I couldn't see her last year, but every time I go to Italy, I see my same friends. Um, so removing boundaries, I think, is the main thing. Um, opting for experiences at Airbnbs or bed and breakfasts um, instead of opting for hotels. Again, a hotel is another barrier between you and the culture. Um, and they're also a lot of times way more expensive depending on where you're going to, which for is, sure. ins yeah, it's insane. Um, so, you know, talking about budget as well, that's another thing that can be, you know, save you a couple of bucks. Um, and, you know, cultural immersive travel is also, um, you know, not necessarily about jam packing your itinerary every day, um, because of course you want to see the sites, guys, see the sites, like go to the Eiffel Tower, it's amazing, go to the Coliseum, go see, um, you know, the Davide from Michelangelo in, in Florence at the Galleria d'Accademia, go do all those things, please do them. But you need to have that wander time in the day because you're going to be looking at what's going on around you and be more present in the moment, which is another thing that's very important about culturally immersive travel. Um, so those are kind of some boundaries that you can remove. Um, and then of course, language is, is a boundary. Um, it can be, and you know, I can definitely help you with that in, in the coaching. Um, and you don't need to learn a whole language guys before you go somewhere, but um, I'll tell you what, 
when you know how to just say hi how are you pleasant morning yeah just those little things people Mm -hmm. just are so that they kind of again removing boundaries they let a little bit down that kind of like oh you're just a tourist you don't care about my home because that's how it can feel to people when you go somewhere get that yeah <laughs> it, I mean, New York, right? It's this is a place where this happens all the time. I went there last year and I saw the same thing. You can kind of tell who's from there and who's not, right? Oh but yeah. They walk in. We always do this trick where we'll just look at up up at like a random building. It's not even a building. Every, all the tourists like look up with us, and I'm like, they're oh looking like a dog. <gasps> oh my god, that's hilarious! You okay. you'll just like make some random like walk up apartment complex famous <laughs> like for no reason just because it will be the the monument <laughs> but i did want to say i love that because what you said about still looking at the sites because yes i'm someone who even in new york living there for the past x amount of years i still when i'm driving up and see that skyline it still gives me chill like i'm still a tourist in my own home you know and i feel like you have to appreciate those sites because a lot of that is the history too um but all my most memory my biggest memory from going to greece was when i was in crete i went to a family's vineyard and got to like can my own kalamata olives and stomp grapes and have lunch with the family and dance with them and this like i was home what they do on their day like i saw them milk goats like it was the coolest thing better than walking through you know the the parthenon you know or whatever (laughs) like so much or the acropolis so much Um, that was cool. But really, being part of someone's family was really awesome. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. Oh, my, and my mom will be all over the Kalamata olives. And oh, oh. she loves she loves the Greek. She loves yeah. the Greek stuff. Um, I'm a on, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's great. Wow, that sounds like amazing. I mean, I, I never, uh, I guess, I guess I always had kind of that that spoiled thing because I had that direct access, you know, through, through exchange programs and through um, that type of, of thing. So that's, uh, that's amazing that you could do that too, because I think that's another thing that's tough for people is, you know, how do I make a meaningful connection with the local when I'm there? Um, obviously in a safe way, um, yeah. in a way that I can communicate and in a way that's going to be like long lasting, right? Because, you know, memories over souvenirs, like always, um and i think for me it was you know just kind of being always present in the moment and like trying to see where less tourists are and where there's a little bit more locals um of course there's going to be places where that's going to be really difficult and there's going to be places where there's no tourists and you're the only one and that's going to be easy um but i think that in um in in countries, um, well, I don't know. I think in New York, I think you guys have cafes. In Boston, it's still kind of not really like a thing. Um, but there's so many countries that, that has that cafe culture. And that would be um, like one of my cultural immersion tips is like sit in a cafe for two hours like an Italian person. Like, I, And people watch. People watching is the best, guys. If you really want to learn what it's like to like be a local with another country, sit at a cafe like Jess said on the sidewalk and people watch watch their mannerisms watch how they interact mm-hmm. now don't be creepy and like stare look up and down people that's a little weird yeah, but you don't be like me I'm so creepy I'm like oh I wonder what neighborhood she lives in oh look at that scarf <laughs> oh his shoes are nice <laughs> I used to be scold my dad was a big people watcher and I always used to be like dad someone's gonna think you're being creepy <laughs> <laughs> I do it all the time I when I was in Bath in England, I sat right outside the Bath Abbey and just drank a glass of wine and just watched people walk by, listen to this guy play Game of Thrones on the fiddle, and it was just the best day. That's sick. Oh my god, really? (laughs) It was amazing. Um, And one thing I want to stress, though, to people, to everyone, is, you know, yes, going out by yourself and, you know, venturing out is something you should be doing. It is something that honestly, like Jess had said about her friends in Italy, I've made the best of friends because of traveling solo, 
one of my like one of my dearest friends actually lives in San Diego. Um, I met her when we were roomed together in Greece on a cruise and she's become one of my dearest friends and I've gone to San Diego and spent a month out there just to visit her for a solid month. And I have a great friend who lives in London and I would not have been able to do that had I had a, cl a, a crutch with me and not saying that going on a trip with somebody is a bad thing, it is not. But I would not have made the new friends I made if I had someone that I was constantly leaning on to, you know, and I was closed out to everybody. I would have been so closed out to everybody else. And, but we want you to do it smartly. And that's what you're going to learn through this series as well. Over the course of this series is traveling solo is liberating. Yes, it is freeing. Yes. And we don't want you to have fear hold you back at all. But you do still have to be smart. So when we say go out there and wander and venture and dive into the culture, we're not saying walk down an alley at three in the morning drunk. <laughs> we're saying- Girl, you better not do that. No, 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 no. I actually leave my drink, uh, like I have my drinks at lunchtime usually when I'm traveling so I'll have a couple glasses of wine with lunch. Mm -hmm. That's my, I don't do the, I'm not a fist bump rager girl anyway. So that doesn't happen. But if you are younger and that is something you really do like to do, do it wisely. Don't, don't mm -hmm. just do it wisely. That's all I'm going to say for it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's, uh, you just gotta, you gotta plan it out, right? Like you said, you have your lunch moment in the piazza with your little vino and everything, and you have your snack and have a nice, or your lunch or whatever. Um, and yeah, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. And, in and, and, uh, not a really a partier. I mean, back in the day, you know, maybe, but not yeah. so much anymore. <laughs> yeah. We're, you know, we got, we got that out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so yeah. And I think if I want to have a glass of wine with my dinner, that's what I do. And it's awesome. And I have two and then I'm, I'm good. I don't need, you know, anything else. Um, and, and, uh, remember that there's communities too, that, that can, um, help you learn these tools like this, um, you know, uh, live that, that you're going to be doing, uh, bi-weekly. I mean, it's going to be so many, different tips um and i would just say you know always just like be being mindful and present in the moment it helps with a lot of this problem i think um of of safety um if you're a solo female traveler um being in the moment being mindful and um something that that something that really has helped me um is something that i do before i get somewhere is that i look at maps um yeah. because i think that when you have your phone out a lot to look up where you're going and walking around with your phone like that. And someone notices you're looking on a map. So these types of dishes, these little things, it can just kind of, um, you know, open up a possibility of something that maybe you don't want to happen. And, uh, and I, and for me personally, I've never had any, um, you know, this type of uncomfortable feeling or a disaster or emergency situation. Um, so I don't want to scare people at all because it's really, um, you know, it's not like a normal thing that happens when you travel alone at all. I don't think, um, but just yeah. being mindful and something like that for me, it was really something that made me feel more confident, look up uh, where I'm staying in relation to like kind of where I'm going and then walk those streets a lot in the day. So at night I'm good. I don't need to take on my phone. I don't need to look up where I'm going. I don't need to turn on that, that GPS voice and, and, you know, tell the world that I don't know where I'm going. So that's just a random tip that no. came floating. Oh, and three key areas that you should really take note for actually really take note of when you are looking at the maps is in relation to where you're staying, make sure you do know the local embassy is, the police yeah. station, the fire station, and the hospital. Because God forbid you at least know where you need to be should you need anything. But same, like I said, I was alone in Peru. I was alone in like. I never felt like I needed to get somewhere quickly because I was uncomfortable. So the same type of gut instinct and caution you take at home when you're walking on your own streets, when I'm walking on the streets of New York, you know what I mean? I mean, I feel, I felt more safe in the middle of Peru. Yes, I could speak a little bit Spanish, but not as much as I obviously can English. I feel, I felt more safe there than I do walking on the own, my own streets at home sometimes. So it's like, you know, you really just, but if you go in with the mindset that something bad's going to happen, something bad's, you're more open to it. So you got to go with confidence and really energy and excited and 
really just go with the best of intentions. And I think the experience is going to be a lot, a lot better for you guys. So oh, sure. we are getting close to time, but we do have a couple questions that came in prior. And if anyone has questions for Jess or even myself, feel free to type it in the comments. You guys have been really active and I appreciate it so much. How much scrolling? But I didn't even see. Oh, I Peru. Oh, there's my friend, the cinnamon traveler. You guys follow him, Ed Head. He's awesome. He, he's a follow you. from Peru. Yay. Um, so Inventive Brush, which is actually my friend Sarah. <laughs> and she said, are there apps that you suggest for solo travels? So I, I want to take this one real quick because so there's a couple apps I'm going to shout out here. But I actually have a huge thing coming out within the next couple weeks that I'm going to be sharing that's going to have all this in there as well. Um, a ton of like apps that's that awesome. you can download and like reference and things like that. But one of my favorite apps is called Tourlina. So T-O-U-R-L-I-N-A. And it is where other solo travel women, it's like a networking for solo travel women. And you can network and connect with other solo travel women in the area you're going to. So you have this interests already similar to each other. And then you can network and go on these, <laughs> on these vacations and you can meet each other while you're abroad. Um, and another really fun kind of kooky one is called Sit or Squat. While I was in Peru and who have gone to uh, like Japan and Vietnam and Thailand know that there are bathrooms that don't necessarily have toilets. They have some, they have ceramic things you put your feet on. You kind of got to have a little bit of a, you know, yoga type maneuver to do what you got to do. And called Sit or Squat is a, it's sponsored by Sherman. And it's actually an app that gives you all of the bathroom locations in the area you are. So it'll tell you if a bathroom is a normal toilet, if it's one of the squatters, if you have to pay, like in Peru, a lot of times you go around, you have to pay uh, 50 soles and stuff like that to to actually sit, um, to actually use a restroom. So these these are just some cool things. I find that personally helpful as a woman who, you know, we don't have the accessibility of bathroom usage as men do sometimes. So. <laughs> I find that um, it's m one of my favorite apps. So those are just a couple that I personally love. And again, I have like eight more that I'm gonna be sharing in this cool little thing coming out soon. Uh, but Jess, do you have any that you use regularly? I don't have apps, but I'm in two um, Facebook groups. Yeah. One is um, Soul Travel Network. I think, are you, are you on one of we're them? I think you're somebody else. Actually. I think you're in, yeah, I think I'm in two of them. I think we're in two of them. <laughs> there's two, and they're both awesome. Oh, there you go. Looks it in. Um, so, yeah, so there's Solo Female Traveler Network on Facebook. Um, and it's a lot of, it's like inspiration based on a lot of photos of really amazing places, but it's also a lot, tons of advice going on, like so much. Um, as well as another one that's a little bit more based on meetups and hosting, um, which is called Host a Sister. So Host a Sister is a fe solo female travel kind of community um, where you can post that you are going to be in this place from these dates and, um, you know, a little background about yourself, maybe where you're from and whatnot. Um, and then you can, um, you know, meet up with people, say you want to meet up or say that you need somewhere to stay. Um, and then also on the reverse, if you want to offer showing someone around where you live, or if you want to host someone, you can also do that. So it's for hosting to stay somewhere, but also to just meet up and have someone show you around cultural immersion in the local way. So that's another, um, another good community. That's amazing. So another question we have is what helped you get over the fear of traveling solo? <laughs> so do you want to take this one first and then? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that, again, for me, for me, it was, again, like I said, it was like an accident. Um, but I did have several months in between knowing that I was going alone and then actually going. Um, so I just made sure that like, I just, I really made sure that everything that I was going to do and everywhere I was going to go, I was just going to love it so much. Like it was just going to be like all day, every day stuff that I really enjoyed doing so that it could kind of like balance out the fact that I was like, well, what am I going to do all day by myself? I think that's one thing. What am I going to do all day, every day alone? I think is, is a lot of, you know, kind of, it's not really a worry, but it's a curiosity, I guess. Um, 
And so just kind of filling out my day with, with things that I really loved, um, that helped me be like, Oh, well, I, I have look at all this stuff I can do. It's all right. I can go alone. It's fine. And, and dating yourself, you guys date yourself, treat, treat yourself, treat yourself, please. People at home and abroad. And guess what? It doesn't have to be money. It doesn't have to be expensive. You know, like you said, get that two euro glass of wine, you know, get that, that two dinar beer or whatever. And like people watch, <laughs> this is so entertaining and you learn a lot. Um, but I think the nervousness again, kind of circles back to a little bit of the advice that we've been giving. Um, you know, knowing where you are is really important to orient yourself in the city um, and, yeah. and stay in a neighborhood that you're going to feel good in as far as, you know, um, noise level and, and population, like how densely it's populated, um, if it's in the buzzing city center or in the suburbs. Um, I think, you know, the more that you can kind of have someone help you cater it to yourself or do, do that catering for, for yourself, um, it's just kind of kind of take away all those worries and concerns. Um, and then just on a last like culturally immersive note that has to do with solo traveling. Um, like we said earlier that sometimes when you get off the plane, you get that like culture smack in the face, which is like a sweet like smack. <laughs> um, and so there's a couple of things you can do before you go to kind of like, it's not going to go away. I'm not saying it's going to go away, but to kind of help you out. Um, you know, you there's now with, with streaming, we have so much access to watching shows and movies in other countries. So I recommend um, doing that. You don't have to have Netflix. You can also look up stuff on YouTube. So you don't need to like pay for streaming services if, if you're not doing that. Um, of course, streaming services has a, lot, has a lot of that as well. And in this way, you can kind of get like an insider's scoop on like how that country's media portrays themselves. Also watching news and talk shows is a good way because it's going to make that like noise in your ear that is language right because all languages is just a bunch of random noises that people in different areas of the world decided to assign meaning to like sound what i'm saying right now is just sounds right um but when you can tune your ear a little bit more to those sounds it definitely takes away that slap in the face and when you're alone that slap can be a little bit more intense sometimes so you can do things before you go to lessen that um by immersing yourself in in media of that country and music, I can't say enough about music. Please listen to music from other countries, even if you can never travel. Um, it, it's, it's, it's like, it really, it opens a door. Um, of, and there's always history behind the music as well, so. One of my old friends is a music producer. She lives in Germany, actually. She lives right in Berlin, and I'm always listening to everything she's posting. I'm just like, there's oh. about the music sometimes in other, Germany is very, yeah, I'm type, you know, techno, they love that. <laughs> 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 Um, but no, yeah, I, I also have to say when it comes to getting over the fear of traveling solo, it's so funny. People who know me know I am a worry wart. I am always worried about something happening to somebody, this and that. When it comes to myself though, I am so fearless when it comes to my own personal, like what I do. And so my, my actual word of advice for getting over the fear is just do it. That's the thing. The more time you sit yep. and just. About it you're gonna get so far into your head and you're gonna give up on your dreams with anything whether it's starting a business whether it's going to college whether it's picking the wedding dress of your dreams the more in the head you are the more negative thoughts are gonna be spewing and you want to manifest positive thoughts you want to believe yes. positive things because if you do good things will happen okay yes it the world has bad things happen sometimes this and that but it's also about the energy you're putting out so definitely just just do it you know because my thought was what if it's my time for something bad to happen it's going to happen whether i'm at home or on the or on a trip and i'd rather be out there doing my love like traveling if some of this so i just say just do it guys um don't let that's my big thing never let fear hold you back from you know living your dreams and getting out there and you know, really learning you know this this world is so magnificent and I really realize um how magnificent it is and one thing with COVID that really and this will segue into our last question one thing with COVID really taught us you know we often forget too like in the U.S. like when I go somewhere I always want to like go to England or go to somewhere in Europe or go somewhere in Latin America or Asia or South America I want to go somewhere else and I you forget how beautiful your own country can be Sometimes, and I started looking at pictures when I was in the West and when I was in the Midwest. And gosh, our country is so beautiful too. 
Um, and so I want to segue into our last question, which is, when will you feel safe traveling again with, you know, the current climate? Um, so Jess, if you want to kind of just say, you know, anything, anything along those lines that can just bring hope to people watching. Yeah, travel. of course. Yeah, for sure. And just also to echo what you just said, like, I'm, I'm a big believer in manifesting, um, sending out the energy that you want to receive back from the universe. So your mindset um, is really huge in, in any, like you said, any type of fear that you have about really anything. Um, if you ask me, you know, when I was a teenager, if I was ever going to go on a solo trip for six weeks, like I did last year, I would be like, hell no, I'm, I would never do that. And you know what? I did, I did that first one by accident. I promise you, I promise you it will completely change your, your life. And, and you will, again, you will be able to love yourself more. Um, but about uh, our current situation um, with, you know, a lot of uh, tragedy around COVID and um, health crisis, and then kind of like another offset of that is the world stopping. Um, I think that, you know, it's given the world time to breathe a little bit and now we're kind of seeing um the uh the kind of you know energy we could give to soul travel by letting places breathe and um going to destinations that are more you know for the locals and more calm to be able to connect and enjoy it more um but i think you know it's not that i feel afraid about it per se i i think that um it's the responsible thing to do is to wait a little bit longer because um you know it's it's one thing if you need to go somewhere to visit family and, and everything like that. Um, I think it also depends on where you live and where you're going. Um, so I know that people are still traveling right now. And um, I think that as long as you are, again, mindful, always um, responsible and follow all of the um, protocols and rules to a T. Um, and, and also, it's not going to cause you any type of like discomfort or anxiety. Um, you know, it, it might be the right moment for you to travel in the super near future, um, if that's something you feel like you're okay with. But I think the, the most important piece uh, for me is the responsibility. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in the US right now, um, we've had some issues with that, and, and it's causing this to last a lot longer. So yeah. um, that's really unfortunate. And, and it's an unfortunate thing for, for a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, um, and not just travel. But um, me, for me personally, um, I'm going to kind of probably wait until like the winter to really consider international travel, places that we're going to be allowed to go. Um, and because usually right now I, I would be planning my whole summer trip for next year already. <laughs> like by this time, I already have like a couple of Airbnbs and I'm chatting with the lady who owns it. And I'm like thinking about, yeah, I'm like, what am I going to eat in on the August 10th or whatever? Um, so I think, you know, there's no, there's no right answer um, for that. But I would say responsibility yeah. is the number one thing for, for that, for me personally. For sure. And I completely agree. I personally am not afraid if, if my company was like, hey, I need you to go here tomorrow, I would go. Mm -hmm. um, I So, but if I'm going to travel, just like Jess says, I'm going to make sure I am following every protocol from the destination at the destination I'm going to. I, you know, living in the New York, New Jersey, get that trip. They're really strict here. Um, I'm sure you guys know a lot of people can't come to our area without quarantine. We're not supposed to go places, you know, it's super, super strict, which kind of is, um, to be honest, you see, I have a ton of friends who live in the UK and I'm always like, oh, you guys are like in Milan right now. What? Like, I know, you know right? I'm seeing so much action on Instagram. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, keep, but, keep Italy hot for me. Keep Italy warm. <laughs> so for when I come back. <laughs> I know. But I have to say like something that is really cool that I'm seeing just from being, does help people plan their trips and book travel for them. Um, and Jess, I know you can see that I've seen a lot of domestic travel. So people exploring our own country, taking precautions and making sure they're following protocol, but taking this time to really explore how beautiful the U.S. is, which it is. And like I was saying before, and then also there are some countries that allow the U.S. to travel to. Um, but I, I would say I already have some trips planned for next year. I'm going to Ireland in May. I'm going to Hawaii in hopefully February, things like that. 
but I'm, I'm cautious, you know what I mean? So as much as I'm booking them this net, I also am, you know, cautious to keep up with the trends and what are happening. So, um, so I want to answer just this last question that we did get from someone viewing, if, if you don't mind, but, um, what are top five international dishes? So I'll say, how about this? Cause I don't have five full ones. So maybe we'll go ping pong. We'll each do one until we get to five. Okay. But I personally, when I was in Austria and Germany, I ate so much freaking like schnitzel. <laughs> oh my God, schnitzel. But... Give me the schnitzel. Yeah. <laughs> I ate so, it was good. It was so, so good. I loved it. And in Austria too, they have these like hot dogs that are like stuffed with cheese. When you go to the, um, to uh, Prada, which is like one of the oldest amusement parks, they have these hot dog type things stuffed with those were um, amazing. So I guess those are two, two dishes that I personally loved when I was in, in Germany, Austria. You What's, know what, what I'm about to say? Um, obviously, I go to Italy a lot. So I'm going to talk about the three Ps, <laughs> which is pizza, pasta, and panini. And no, there's so much other food in Italy. Um, but I think for me, one of the most memorable meals, I think that's how kind of how I think about this question too, is like, what's the most memorable meal that I've had? Um, and it's, it's not a fancy thing either, like the schnitzel, right? I mean, a lot of times you guys like the, the traditional food or the most famous food of an area, actually a lot of times like pizza, it came out of a history of poverty. Think about pizza, bread, uh, a, a, a tomato. In the long Spanish restaurants, best Spanish food you'll ever get. Than some exactly. Food. Yeah. So, you know, this is, this comes out of like those traditions of, and um, I mean, pizza, it, it's back to for, forever and ever and ever ago. And then also became like official, you know, right before Italy was unified. Um, but for me, it was a day where me and my mom were on a road trip in Italy and we, um, there's, there's a lot of pizza on this day. So I think I'll do the pizza with my mom that day because that was a special day. So we're, we're driving from uh, right outside of Rome to go down to Naples to meet my friends. Um, and uh, we're like, all right, we gotta stop and we gotta eat and you know, go to the bathroom, get some water. It's like really hot, it's, just, it's July in Italy. Oh, mamma mia, it's so hot then. Um, so we went to this town and like, didn't, didn't look at what it was or anything. We're like, whatever the next exit is, I'm starving, I'm gonna die. So we go to this town, I look at the map, I'm like, yeah, it looks, it looks like we can park over here because that's another issue with in Italy if you're driving is it's not always gonna be easy to park. So I'll try to speed up my long story. I, I always go into tangent stories. So we go to this, we're walking around and it's like lunchtime, of course it's, and I know it's gonna be like this. July, middle of the day in Italy, everyone's home, no one's out. I'm like, shit, is anything gonna be open? I'm starving. And we found this like one place open and it's, um, it's not around pizza, it's called pizza a taglio, which means like cut pizza. And in Italy, people literally, when they're home, they use scissors to cut the pizza. They don't use, uh, or, or they use a fork and knife. They eat it with a fork and knife. They don't eat it with their hands. Yeah. Um, and we went to this pizza Italio place. And there, of course, like we're in this town called Casino. And um, there was, it's not a tourist town at all. It's like, you know, no one was there. And we had the best freaking pizza Italio. I, oh my God, it was so good. My mom got this one with like potatoes on it. I don't even remember what, what I got. I was like, hi, it was so, so good. And then we're sitting that we went to get a coffee after we're sitting there and I'm looking around and my mom's like, what's that mountain? And I'm like, I don't know. What the hell is that? I look it up on a map and we see this huge, huge structure on top of it. And it was an abbey. It was the Apatia di Monte Cassino. And it's actually a very um, historically important abbey from World War II. And there's a large uh, Polish cemetery over there on the mountain. So we're like, screw it, let's drive up the mountain. And, and just because we stopped to have that amazing pizza, like that came, like another, you know, thing came out of it. So basically another plug for slow travel here is that if we didn't do that, we would have never like just stumbled upon this, you know, Beautiful. thing. And we had time because we were, we were never really in a rush on that trip. Um, so yeah. pizza for me, what's, you got another one? <laughs> okay, I have two weird, like one that was like a surprise to learn and one that was kind of like a weird thing to try, but when in, you know, when in Rome, they say, I wasn't in Rome, I was in Peru, but you know what I mean. Um, so the weird one was, I didn't realize how carb heavy a lot of Greek food is. And I did not know their hieros have French fries in them. Yes. So <laughs> I did not know that. I thought it was just like, you know, what I get from here, like a chicken Slovakia put into a 
pita. Um, but no, they put French fries in them. So that was the odd thing. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I did not know that. Y'all are so healthy, yet you eat so many carbs. I don't understand. <laughs> when I was in Peru, um, so we ate a lot of pumpkin soup. That was like our carb food while we were hiking much fries. And also I did try koi. So for those who don't know koi, a lot of people think they hear koi and it's a fish. It's not. Koi is oh, guinea okay. pig. Oh my God. Really? You had koi? So, it's a very, very popular there. Um, and I, I went to a guinea pig farm. Had I gone to the guinea pig farm before I ate the guinea pig, I would not have eaten the guinea pig um, based on how, how they are pet um, <laughs> and stuff like that. But I definitely did try it. I mean, it was okay. To me, it reminded me a little bit of, like, rabbit um, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But I, I just figured, like, I have to try it. I'm here. I'm never going to eat it again. So what's a little bite? However, they served it, like, yeah. the whole thing on a darn stick. So it's, like... <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, <laughs> presentation is everything, right? <laughs> exactly. But, all right, guys. I think we're going to call it because we definitely have been on here for quite a while. And I know it's a school night. Um, yes, it but is, girl. You know it. <laughs> that, thank you so much. This was so much fun. Thank and you. Yeah. Learned a lot. Um, if you, Jess, if you want to just shut up and get a hold of you, if they want to learn more about cultural immersion, that would be great. Yeah, you guys follow me at the Wonder Word. Um, and uh, I'm doing a lot of different stuff in there right now. Travel memories, obviously, because I'm not traveling. Um, every Tuesday is Talk Tuesdays, where I teach you a little bit of the languages that I know. Um, and then you can uh, feel free to DM me, or also you can email me at jess at thewanderword.com. Um, if you're interested in any coaching services, language services, or just like general travel planning, like the normal like travel agent stuff to um, just a plane ride and, and all that hotel stuff too, I can also do that for you guys. So, and uh, website coming soon, website crossing my fingers um to uh, by the end of the year so then you can really um you know dive into that and and see the blog and everything um but for now at the wonder word on insta and then just at the wonder um thank you so much and don't worry if you miss some of this live we will be i will be sharing it after so you'll be able to watch this um later definitely a lot of great stuff and i look forward to seeing you all on october 21st at 7 p.m we have a lovely woman named Alexa joining us, and she's going to talk about her experience traveling to Vietnam um, and what that was like for her. So definitely join in 21st at 7 p.m. to visit Alexis and I as we as we have that that episode. So thank you so much, everyone. And yes, I will have this live saved and up on my story. No worries. It might just take a minute to download. So have a good night, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Bye, guys. Bye. Ciao. Grazie. Adios. <laughs> Brava.